Good morning everyone, this is Jared Cagas again, a senior clerk of CIM Medicine and now I'll be presenting to you bleeding and thrombosis for today. And now let's begin with our hemostatic system with its particular components, namely the platelets, the plasma proteins, as well as the vessel wall. Now the hemostatic system under normal circumstances will promote hemostasis by regulating blood flow and being prepared to clot blood rapidly in order to arrest blood flow. The hemostatic system provides a natural balance between procoagulant and anticoagulant forces as seen in this diagram. Let's concentrate on the procoagulant forces. So upon vascular injury, the endothelial cells, monocytes, and the platelets themselves are activated. There is also a translocation of the procoagulant head groups and there's release of microparticles, which provide further factors for coagulation. Now, let us talk about the procoagulant forces in proper. First, the platelet adhesion and aggregation, and fibrin clot formation. But let's talk about platelet adhesion and aggregation. This begins with a platelet plug formation, which is then subsequently followed by platelet adhesion. That results in subsequent platelet activation and aggregation. Platelet activation converts our inactive GP2B and 3A receptors to active GP2B and 3A receptors. Now remember this. Now this enables binding of fibrinogen and the von Willebrand factor. This is a large multimeric protein serving primarily as the molecular glue that prevents clots from being torn apart by shear stress. Now that we've discussed platelet activation, this would result in a release reaction, which also promotes in platelet aggregation. More on that later. Now let's talk about the release reaction. This inhibits the anticoagulant endothelial cell factors. Platelet aggregation, as a matter of fact, recruits additional platelets to the site of vascular injury, forming a thrombus or a platelet plug. Now, remember our GP2B and 3A that were activated before? Now, due to its surface abundance, there is a rapid formation of thrombus. And this is anchored by a developing fibrin mesh that keeps things tied down together. Now that we've discussed platelet adhesion and aggregation, let's discuss fibrin clot formation. Take note that these reactions take place on phospholipid surfaces and usually deactivated platelet surface. They serve to localize also blood clotting to sites of vascular injury, and they culminate in the formation of fibrin, which is achieved by blood coagulation. Coagulation goes by extrinsic pathway or by the intrinsic pathway, the extrinsic pathway or the intrinsic pathway, both of which produce thrombin, which subsequently produces fibrin. Upon vessel injury, the tissue factor binds with an activated factor 7, which in turn activates factor 10 and 9. 9 activates factor 8 and factor 5 respectively, which produces our beloved thrombin, which produces fibrinogen to fibrin. If our tissue factor and factor 7 are inactivated by the tissue factor pathway inhibitor, also known as TI, then this makes our coagulation dependent on the amplification loop through factor 9 and 8. Thrombin activates protein C, which becomes an anticoagulant at this point. Activation physiologically occurs on thrombomodulin, which is a transmembrane spanning the cell membrane. Protein C binds to protein C receptors, which may have mutation at specific cleavage sites such as factor V Leiden, leading to hypercoagulability. Protein C cleaves and inactivates factors 5 and 8. With the aid of protein S, which undergoes vitamin K-dependent post-translational modification. Now that we have discussed our procoagulant forces, let us now turn to our anticoagulant forces. And as to every yin and yang, we have our anticoagulant forces which are activated to maintain patency of circulation by intravascular fibrin. We have two major anticoagulant forces, the natural inhibitors of coagulation produced by endothelial cells, 
This is also activated by fibrinolysis. More on that later. Well, our endothelial cells have anticoagulant factors that inhibit platelet adhesion, platelet aggregation, and platelet activation. And we have so many anticoagulant factors, but we'll concentrate more on the tissue pathway inhibitor. This is a plasma protease inhibitor that regulates the tissue factor-induced extrinsic pathway of coagulation, essentially turning off the initiation of coagulation by this way, essentially turning off the tissue factor, factor 7A initiation of coagulation, which then becomes dependent on the amplification loop. This also inhibits the factor 10A that is bound to 5A making everything dependent on the amplification loop started by thrombin and on factor 11. Now talking about anticoagulant factors, antithrombin is the major thrombin inhibitor and in the presence of heparin, the rate of formation of these inactivating complexes increased by a factor of several thousand. Antithrombin also obviously inhibits thrombin now that we have discussed the anticoagulant factors, let's go back to the endothelial cells. So these cells, these complexes, include the major protease plasmin, also the release of plasmin. What plasmin does will be discussed shortly. So we start with Urokinase type plasminogen activator and our thromboplastin activator, both of which convert plasminogen to plasmin. Plasminogen activator inhibitor inhibits our tissue plasminogen activator. These are fibrin degradation products, also known as FDPs. Anifi plasmin is complexed with alpha 2 antiplasmin. In order to simplify things, plasmin is essentially digesting fibrin in order to produce fibrin degradation products. Now let's turn our attention to fibrinolytic mechanisms. They act on thrombin. Thrombin that escapes the inhibitory effects of the physiologic anticoagulant systems. This converts fibrinogen to fibrin, as you can see in this picture here which creates D-dimers and therefore may be used as specific tests for fibrin degradation. Now that we're done discussing the natural balance between these two forces, we can now begin our approach. Let us begin with acquiring a detailed family history. A detailed family history may determine the chronicity of symptoms or it may determine who are genetically at risk for thrombi formation, which may increase the risk for genetic thrombophilia. Family history can give clues as to the etiology of the disorder, depending on the site of bleeding or thrombosis, or whether it was enhanced by a medical condition or by medications such as NSAIDs, especially aspirin, all of which can precipitate GI bleeding. Underlying disease must also be pursued in the history, as these are often secondary to or accompanied with bleeding disorders. Now for our approach to the history of bleeding. The history of bleeding is the most important predictor of bleeding risk. Therefore, it is important to elicit a bleeding history. Spontaneous hemarthrosis, as seen in this picture, may be the hallmark of a moderate and severe factor, factor 8 and 9 deficiency. Mucosal bleeding history, as seen in this picture, may be suggestive of disorders of primary hemostasis or platelet plug disformation. History have many complaints such as easy bruisability, heavy menses, and epistaxis. Let's begin with the easy bruisability. This may be a sign of a blood vessel abnormality once you exclude domestic violence, of course and heavy menses, which is common in women with underlying bleeding disorders and is defined as greater than 80 ml of blood per cycle. But this has poor correlation with bleeding loss. Why 80 ml? This is the quantity of blood required to produce iron deficiency anemia. Epistaxis may be normal, may be normal in children and in dry climates, but this may also be a sign of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia or von Willebrand's disease. 
so there are clues of underlying bleeding disorders such as a lack of seasonal variation or bleeding that requires medical intervention. A bleeding history of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome may also be acquired by easy bruisability or by hyperflexion of joints or hyperextension of joints. Senile purpura may also be identified by history alone. These usually occur on older people which have changes in their skin and subcutaneous tissue and may have possible bleeding upon minor trauma, just as shown here on the image. Now, let's talk about our approach for thrombosis. First, there are two types, the arterial thrombosis and venous thrombosis. For arterial, the most significant risk factor would be atherosclerosis, so it may be a good idea to reduce your fat intake. The second would be venous, which has major risk factors that are so many, such as age, genetic predisposition, malignancy, immobility, a prior surgical operation, or obesity. Age, however, the risk of DVT increases per decade, and it must be noted. The next step is to determine whether the event was idiopathic or precipitated. If there is no underlying malignancy, idiopathic source can be considered, which is the strongest predictor for VTE recurrence. However, if it is precipitated, then a thrombotic event must be pursued and investigated further. Our approach for laboratory evaluation would mostly be complementary as we could mostly identify uh, bleeding and thrombotic disorders based on history and PE alone. So this only serves as a complementary diagnostic tool. Screening tests would include thrombin platelet count and prothrombin time, which would determine liver function or vitamin K deficiency. Another one would be specific factor assays to determine the actual culprit for the disease. Another would be the platelet function tests, which, would, could, which could be done for platelet disorders. Mixing studies are usually done to evaluate a prolonged APTT or PT or to distinguish between a factor deficiency and an inhibitor. Antiphospholipid antibody testing may also be done. This is simply testing antibodies that are interfering and are termed lupus anticoagulants. Then you can do prothrombin time, which is one of the more important screening tests. The INR equation is shown above as a reference. INR was developed to assess a stable coagulation and assessed would be fibrinogen, prothrombin, factors 5, 7, and 10 by PT. And APTT and other screening tests is important. This assesses the intrinsic and common pathways such as factor 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, 12, and 2, fibrinogen, precalicrine, and high molecular weight kinetogen. And that is it for today, everyone. Thank you all for listening and this would be my main refer reference for this uh, episode. Thank you and thank you for listening.